right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, so we're going to talk about mastering consistency today. And my name is Mandy Englert. I'm a solutions consultant with FFW, uh, mostly for our higher education and nonprofit clients. And Amanda? I'm Amanda Kanopko. I am the director of our experience design department. We're a mix of content strategists, UX researchers, and UI designers. Awesome. So we live in this very multi-channel world where we have users who have these preferences for different channels, um, different ways of interacting between you know, mobile devices, tablets, desktops, and we're trying to hit these people on all of these different channels. And we've gotten pretty good at putting content on all of these different channels. And our perception here is normally that users interact with each one of these touch points and they love us, they care about us, they want more from us, and we're creating this very easy to use, very good journey. But our reality <laughs> is that, you know, we are constantly begging for the attention of our users, and they love it. <laughs> they love that we're constantly begging um, because it makes for a more user-centric journey. Every time that we're able to personalize something more and more to a channel that they like and love and want to be on, the more that they are going to interact with our brand, the more that they're going to be involved with us. So they love that we're begging. <laughs> so what we have here, we're just going to look at a piece of content here, um, just kind of a landing page. And Amanda, could you actually walk us through, you know, what makes this successful? Sure. So we've got a, I'm just going to move this down a little bit. We have since a height difference. Since I'm shorter. <laughs> um, so we've got a landing page here. And what makes this landing page successful is that it is action oriented. So we know what the user is looking to do. And the page is focused on giving the user that correct pathway in order to get them to where they would like to go. Um, the content is short. It's focused on that utility. The design is emphasizing the key CTAs for that journey pathway. The UX writing is aligned with the user's attitude. That's very important when you're dealing with a CTA-oriented page. Um, and there's supplemental content. There's also that shareability um, through social media and being able to kind of pass this on as well. So overall, when we look at this piece of content, we're thinking, this is a really good piece of content. Let's put this across all of these different channels that we have right now and look at all of the different ways that we can get people to interact, come to this page, and learn more about us. But we have to determine where to place that content and understand the restrictions around that content. So if we're placing this on Facebook, for instance, we have a limited character count limited images, and GIFs are a little bit limited too. If we're going to email or text message, we're limited even more. So it starts to get really complex when you're going across the organization and you're saying, hey, you know, this is really great content, uh, Facebook team, why don't you go and post this over here? And then they have to try to take pieces of that landing page, that really great piece of content, and try to actually make it work for that channel. And what we see because of that or is this journey where it's a very up and down sort of battle. So people you know, are having really great interactions with the brand and we're seeing things working really well across that first time that they hear about that piece of program content versus when they actually go and, and register for that program. So we're seeing these touch points on the bottom here that have these negative interactions. They're not getting the experience that they want from the channel that they want that from. And you know we're faced with a lot of challenges to get there. Um, one of the biggest ones that we hear quite a bit is around governance. So getting folks on the same page with the voice, the tone, and the branding, this ends up being a really big problem, especially uh, with our higher ed and our nonprofit clients, trying to get everyone on the same page. Uh, seeing unavailable design assets um, or different looking design assets across these websites. Um, an inability to move quickly to changing strategies. So sometimes, you know, we had that big Facebook change a couple years ago where, uh, you know, they're starting to deprecate third-party cookies and everyone started panicking and saying, oh my God, this channel's not working for us. So they started changing the content. They started changing the images. They started changing the way that they were doing these things 
which made it less consistent um, from that landing page to that channel. Um, and then data flows. Uh, a lot of times we're tracking our data through one single channel. So we'll be looking at an Instagram feed and we'll check all of the data through that one Instagram feed. Or even when you're looking at a website, you're looking at that one website. You're not looking at how that piece of content is going across every website. And the biggest challenge is these restrictive limits. Um, so there's a huge difference between people that are actively browsing your content and people that are just passively browsing. And there's different channel strategies that you need to be aware of depending on where you want to put your content. Whether it's a bunch of different uh, websites in your ecosystem, um, your main website, uh, different social channels or text messages, email is always a big one um, that, that's very limited. So, you know, it's, it's trying to build these strategies across the board. And you know, some of the things that people will ask us is, well, you know, what if I just pick one or two of those channels? And I'll have my website, I'll have one or two of those channels, and that way, you know, I don't overload myself. Okay, but when you want to start to scale and you need to hit more of those channels, so for instance, like Snapchat, five years ago, if you would have invested a ton of time in that, that would have been a great investment. Now, you don't even see Snapchat up here because <laughs> not a lot of people are even investing um, in, in these networks. So it's, you know, it changes so often, you need to have a scalable approach to hit all of these different channels all the time. And so Amanda, I know that you talk to our clients about this all the time. Take so us through. <laughs> how do you deal with having to have all of those different strategies for all of those different channels? The starting point is structured content. Having structured content allows you to build out a piece of content, all the comprehensive pieces of it, so that you can then take that and pass that to whichever channel that you are looking to put that piece of content on. Uh, this allows you to uh, better support accessibility and semantics and metadata. It's also future-proofing your system because if you have very set fields, within your content, then you can easily scale those fields over time. Um, it also enables better analytics. If we have pieces of content that are broken down accurately, we can better track those individual pieces as well. And then this also promotes content sharing. So if you have kind of many different channels that you're looking to uh, put this piece of content on, you can take those very specific fields that you need for your specific channel that you're working with. And in order to have structured content, the editorial experience becomes really, really important. So in order for us to share across those touch points, we need to make sure that our content creation process is smooth, that it's efficient, and that it's giving a proper process for the people who have to edit that content. Um, Content becomes more adaptable when we're thinking about the content editors and how they need to manage it, as well as we need to have a high governance strategy. So if you have many people who are in it, having their hands in the pot, we need to make sure that if this content is going to all of these different places, that we are managing the workflows, we are managing the voice and tone, and that we are managing that consistency. One thing to think about um, when you are creating structured content is dissecting some of the layout options that you normally see from your editing experience. So if we know that this piece of content needs to go to many places, it might not always have the same layout. So we need to make sure we're taking that layout out of the picture so that we can then provide that content to as many places as possible without having to um, you know, make sure that it's meeting all of the layout needs across all of the channels. I'm gonna pass it back to Mandy. Yeah, so it's really important to understand where you're starting with your organizational structure as well. So there's a lot of different organizational structures that you may line up to and it really like, it doesn't matter if you're starting with this IT led platform or having this marketing led platform, but it's it's good to understand what you're starting with so you know where you can go and where you can scale from. So what we saw in the past was a lot of very like 
IT-led, starting from that platform. Marketers were sometimes editing content. Um, you know, sometimes they were doing some of the campaigning. Um, to what we see today a lot more often with marketing-led platforms where the marketers are very involved. They're really, um, you know, working with all of the content. They're working with all of these different channels. They're working with IT professionals to set up um, the websites overall. And then we see kind of a hybrid of both uh, within that too. So the approach that you take to create these omni-channel experiences starts with really understanding kind of where you're starting from, who you need to talk to, and you know where to, to start that. So there are different approaches um, to drive performance here. Uh, we are going to talk about three of them because we have an hour. <laughs> um, and I could talk about maybe 29 different ones, uh, but these are the three that we see the most, um, especially in our agency, but just across the ecosystem as well. Um, so the first one being cross-site. Uh, so this is more, you know, you have multiple websites. You really focus on that design experience. Um, so, and usually you're using sort of like a Drupal multi-site in this, in this instance. Um, and you have multiple editing experiences. So you have that stakeholder autonomy where stakeholders can create their own experiences, but they're all lining up to a component strategy, a design strategy, and they are sharing some of that content. Federated content um, is where you're enhancing that design consistency. We're kind of assuming that you already have that design system and that model really set up internally, and you're able to use a fixed content model to populate content from a single source. So we see this a lot um, with like a directory, for instance. So if you have like a faculty directory or organizational directory um, that changes all the time and you have one group of people that are using that, um, you know, they're editing it in that single system and then they're syndicating it to all of these different websites and possibly channels. I don't know why I would put a faculty profile on a channel, but you could, technically. <laughs> so, um, this can go across channels because you're using that single source API there. And then the Content Hub model, this is where you're getting to really true omni-channel experiences here. Um, you have a much more unified and cohesive experience across that journey. You're enabling personalization at this point but has very, very high governance. So you need to understand the roles, the responsibilities, and who is sort of involved in this. You're typically using a headless or a decoupled architecture, um, and you're really syndicating this content from multiple sources, uh, coming into that unified place, and then syndicating that out across your channels. Um, and that is what we would recommend the most when we're getting into those omni-channel experiences and really kind of promoting that content across all of these different places. So um, I'm gonna pass off to Amanda to start us off talking about cross-site. Awesome. So for cross-site, as Mandy had mentioned, this is going to be more of kind of unique website experiences. It's not gonna be fully cross-channel. Um, and there's gonna be a focus more so on design consistency, some content consistency, but more autonomy between the websites. So you may need to have, let's say, um, a system where many departments need many different websites, um, and they all need to have kind of their own content strategies, their own look and feels, but they need to kind of um, be reined in a little bit and have some of that design consistency. So we are gonna have a centralized design system uh, when it comes to these more multi-site, cross-site types of experiences. Um, that is gonna give you um, accessible layouts, some of those role-based configurations to give a unique look and feel, but still have some of that constraint. Um, structured content, super important still, even though we might not be sharing all of our content, there is still going to be some content or at least some content types that will be shared amongst the sites. So we kind of wanna have the same base system, but we wanna allow that autonomy between the content itself. And then intuitive content authoring. Because we are um, making sure that that base structure is there for our content types, that allows our authors kind of that consistency in the um, content creation experience, but again, that autonomy in what they're trying to say. So the content sharing ability for cross-site 
is going to be more through feeds. So if we have to share content, um, you're either going to be cloning that content and then putting it on another site. Because again, those content structures are there underneath. So you can easily take a piece of content and put it on another site. And those editors can then go in, adjust that messaging for their own site. Um, there's also RSS feeds or, or things that can be set up so that content can be pulled in and then not edited at all. Um, there is going to, again, be that design system. So we're going to have that seamless and cohesive design experience between the websites. And then this also is going to um, just make it more seamless for all of your editors and for your users overall. Yeah, and there's a lot of different Drupal architectures to use. When we're talking about multi-site, we're talking about this content sharing ability. Um, there's a lot of things that you can use here. Uh, so we look at three sort of pieces uh, to start to choose that architecture based on the amount of content that you're actually sharing. So we look at the architecture. So are you going with a traditional approach, uh, decoupled, um, really kind of that progressive area? Um, we'll start to make some decisions around that. We will go into the Drupal structure itself. Um, so looking at Drupal multi-site or domain access or um, a Drupal distribution overall. Um, so we'll look at those and those really are dependent on how much content you are planning on sharing across your site. So if you're planning on having a multi-site that shares almost everything, except for a couple of tiny little things, that's a very different model in, in multi-site than you would actually use that's going to be very heavy on stakeholder autonomy, they're only using a design system, and um, there's a couple of choice things that, that you're sharing across. And the last thing that we'll look at is those product selections. So things like Aquia Site Factory, Pantheon Custom Upstreams, these are all things that we'll talk about um, as just part of the product selection. We like to use a lot, um, a lot of times what you already have available uh, to get that multi-site going. Um, but that Drupal structure piece is so important when you're talking about content sharing because it will help you determine how much, um, what type of Drupal structure to go with. And a good example of this um, is actually we, we worked with uh, Stanford FSI um, who, yeah, just, you know, stand in front of the camera. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Yeah. He's my boss, so I'm allowed to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is, <laughs> we're looking at these three different screenshots using the same design system. Um, and they're, they look very, very similar across all three of these three different websites but they have a lot of stakeholder autonomy here too to have their own content. So they're using the same designs, they're using the same sort of design system, they're in the same model overall, so we have 40 websites in the single web platform that are actually kind of going across and having all these, this different content, but they're still sharing a couple of really specific things. So they're sharing directory listings, uh, they're sharing news listings, where it's all created in this sort of one place and able to go across all of these websites. There are challenges to multi-site. Um, so, you know, there's going to be challenges to any approach that you take. Um, and while you have these really unique design experiences, the tone and voice has that opportunity to be really different across the websites. So as you saw in those three different uh, website examples before, they're really very similar. They feel like they're the same brand. They are the same brand. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they all feel the same, but they're really, they have very specific and different content in each of those places. So if you're trying to get that content to be exactly the same, making sure that you know, this doesn't change over and over and over again, then you know, that's a very, very different approach um, than you would do with like a multi-site. Um, the marketing campaigns usually are not aligned in this model. Um, so a lot of the things that I always hear from marketers is saying, well, I don't know what they're doing on that website. Um, you know, we're, we don't have access to those analytics, but we're doing this over here. Just worry about this over here. 
So um, there's still not really that, that heavy uh, governance to get people aligned from an analytics and a metrics perspective. Um, and it's really difficult to apply that analytics really holistically. Um, we've done that with design system. You know, we can track the analytics from that piece, but you can't really track it from that content, that deep content perspective. And now we can go through federated. Awesome. So federated content is starting to get into that in-between space between a kind of like multi-site and omni-channel experience. So federated content is going to allow you to share that distinctive content type across um, many different channels. So we're still going to have that kind of more fixed content model, but there's going to be even more structure in this case. Um, we're going to have to make sure that we have this kind of centralized system to manage this content, and it's going to be highly governed because it's going to many places. Um, also, there's an opportunity for enhanced analytics because again, we're sharing that content a little bit more. We don't have different content strategies for this specific piece of content that we're looking to share. Um, so that allows us to really make sure that we can track and then use that tracking um, and that data to make decisions around do we need additional content added in. Again, that scalability comes into play because we're structuring our content appropriately um, and we can enhance the user experience in that way as well. For uh, federated content, content sharing, um, you are syndicating that content normally from an API that content is living in a centralized system, as I had mentioned, and the, um, the content is going to be managed by a key group of stakeholders to make sure that um, not everyone has their hand in the pot for this situation. Um, that facilitates that scalability so that over time, if you're seeing in your data, you're seeing in your content needs that you need to add additional fields into your system, additional pieces of content into your system to support the user journey, you can. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in how um, this content can be presented because again, it's a cross channel and you may not have the same design experience for each of those channels. It's going to be slightly similar because we're using that same content base, but each channel can have a different set of fields that they are pulling from this API and from this database. And that's what makes the cross-channel piece like really important in this model because now you can feed those important fields to that other channel. So you can feed that to um, like a social media platform, for instance, and that way you have that consistent messaging without having to leave that up to the person who's running Facebook. You can really say, hey, the content's really there, put the design around it, put the extra things around it that, that needs to be there for that channel, but start with this content. Yep. And um, there is also the, the ease of when you update any of that content in that database, it's being pushed out to all of those different experiences. So you only edit it once, which saves you a lot of time. Um, anything else, Mandy, before I no. pass it over to you? Um, so I always like to really talk about this when it comes to measure, measuring that usage and engagement. So you have a bigger opportunity in this model to be able to measure that content more holistically. So now through that API, you can start sending those really track, those bigger tracking parameters to really say, hey, I wanna see how many times someone interacted with this field, or I wanna see how people engage with these pieces and send that back to sort of like a central, like Google Analytics account or a central source where you can start to see how that's going across all of your different websites but also, you know, there's different channels that you have in the mix. And usually this is like one piece of content that you're using, um, that you're using this for, that you're working against. So it makes it a lot easier to be like, okay, I'm gonna set up this measurement account, this Google Analytics account, just for my program marketing. And I wanna see how this program is performing across all of these different channels and also against um, all of these different websites that are ingesting it. 
And where we typically see this, um, I, I like to use higher ed examples. Um, so we're talking about like a program finder here. So um, what we see a lot in higher education is that there's hundreds of course listings. Um, so there's course listings, there's different programs, and they're usually managed every semester, um, every quarter. Like you're really seeing these change consistently. And there's usually one department in the organization that's actually like managing these pieces. So what you can start to use that program finder for is that one source is going to be managing all of those course listings, all of those pieces, and then you can syndicate that information about that program from that single API to all of these different websites. And where we see an example of that would be, um, so like on your admissions website, you would have every single program listed. Everyone's looking at that from a broad perspective because they wanna just find all the different programs that are available. Then you get down to the department site, you know, you found a user who's really interested in a program, they wanna learn more, they wanna start connecting with the faculty and, and the people on the campus, so they go to the department website. Now they're presented with just those five programs. It's the same information, we're still showing the same type of consistent experience, but now we're just seeing these five, and we also can build an entire experience around those five programs. So we have this really consistent um, message around the program itself, but then we can build experiences that are personalized to the user within that channel specifically. That way, you know, you're personalizing that experience. Like what I was saying at the very beginning, you know, we're trying to hit all of these people on different channels in the way that they want to interact with us. So we want to personalize that content as much as possible to get them through that journey without having as much of those steep down pieces to it. Uh, so challenges to this approach. There is higher governance in this content model. Um, so, you know, what we'll start to see, uh, something that, that I had worked uh, with a higher ed on was, you know, we had just actually pushed out a new course listing uh, syndicated content uh, that was going across the university um, and there were a lot of mixed feelings about, about that content. They did not like it um, and our uh, campus partners that, that had to ingest that content um, and were looking at that content, they were saying, wow, this doesn't meet any of my needs. I don't like this content. I'm not going to use any of this. I'm just going to write my own. So now I have people on 20 websites that just want to kind of write their own content for that program and not use the stuff that's changing all the time. Um, so it's one of those things that you need to be able to talk to those people and help them understand, you know, these are the pieces that you absolutely need to ingest because for the organization, if something changes, you, you don't want that to be showing incorrectly um, on different experiences. But then you can build that experience around it. So we were able to kind of help those partners really see, okay, you're just gonna take this messaging. You're just gonna take this piece of it, but now you can build an entire experience around it. Let's have all these extra pages that talk about the faculty and talk about um, the, the way that students interact with people in the program. So it, it, it does take that kind of give and take in, in talking to people about that because there is that limited flexibility. And that's, Mandy, if I could jump in oh, for yeah. a second. <laughs> um, for federated content, something that's really important to think about is that what are the things that are going to be your federated content? You shouldn't have federated content for everything. Yes. It should be very distinctive pieces of content that need to be shared and the content needs to stay the same so that that ingestion works in the system and then also giving that flexibility around it and understanding what pieces of content need to be more editorialized on each experience um, that you're bringing that content into. So that's something to think about with federated content is that like it will not work for everything. Yeah. Um, it is supposed to be for things like courses, like programs, like products, that sort of stuff where you don't need that storytelling around it, you just need the data. Yeah, that's actually a really good way to think about it. And, um, and you know, if you're trying to have that more visual design experience around it, it can get really complex in this federated content model. You know, people are, ex like, expecting 
more innovative, um, rich, interactive content and more personalized digital experiences. So um, this approach makes it a little bit more difficult to get to that place unless you're building that content around it. So um, it's just something to keep in mind in this model, and that's why uh, you made a really good point, Amanda, to do it for the things that make sense for your organization. Don't do it for your entire website. And the last one we're gonna talk about is Content Hub. Yeah, and go ahead, Amanda. Awesome, so Content Hubs are best for creating those omni-channel level experiences. Um, it's going to allow you to share content across many touch points, still give some editorial um, vision to those different experiences, but kind of keep that unification um, alive. Also, this is going to be less of um, a design exercise. You might have a design system um, that you're using for one channel and you may need a different design system that maybe is similar, but has different types of things in it and has a different look and feel for different channels. So you may see that in a content hub type of experience that you're going to have different design that's coming out of this as well. The content is generally staying within the same larger scale content strategy though across the organization. Um, so this type of experience is going to um, optimize content for many channels, as I had mentioned. You get to customize those, the content, you get to customize the layouts and the messaging based on the channel that you're trying to push that content to. Again, there's that unified analytics approach because if we're using structured content to send out to all of these different places, we can then track that content better and we can easily make more data-driven decisions. We can also use that analytics data to then personalize the experiences on top of that and personalize that content where it's being delivered as well. Um, this requires a high governance strategy um, because again, you need to have a consistent content strategy across the organization. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have um, different editorial autonomy between the different places that you're pushing the content. It just means that you have to kind of see the bigger picture in order to build the structure of the content appropriately. So content sharing. This is going to streamline your content management. Again, if we have one piece of content, let's say it is um, about a program, but it's not coming from federated content. This is just a, um, a nice editorial piece of content that lots of people want to use. You want to use it across channel. Um, you are then able to do that, and we are going to need to provide kind of approval workflows and some of that governance layer on top of it, because again, that piece of content is going to lots of different places. Um, content needs to be structured. So in this system, it's probably the most structured other than federated content, which is highly, highly structured, but it takes a similar approach. Um, and that allows editors to kind of streamline that content entry, but still provides the autonomy in delivering those tailored experiences. Kind of takes away the need for content editors to be spending their valuable time in the content management system and allows them to actually market their content appropriately. This enables personalized experiences. As I had mentioned, you can have a piece of content and then if you have an appropriate tagging system and this is structured content, then we can have many different versions of that content for different types of audiences. And when we're sending that out to the correct places, we can say in this place, this needs to be more for this audience. Or if we know data about that user, serve up this piece of content instead. And then again, the governance piece, you're going to have lots and lots of stakeholders um, who are managing content and you need to make sure that you have the proper workflows and kind of the proper governance to make sure that someone is not going in and adjusting content that could be in 10 different places across 10 different channels. Yeah, and you know, a lot of times when we're talking about these models and we're trying to get this content hub set up, um, you know, we make that very clear to organizations that you can't just set up this piece of technology and it'll fix all of the organizational problems and everything just works miraculously. Um, you really have to understand 
how this is going to work with your organization. So it does change the way that you're kind of doing those things. You have different roles, you have different responsibilities for everyone that is touching that content. So you have to make sure that you're doing a very deep discovery on this and really understanding, you know, what are these things that that need to happen in a content hub. So uh, some of the questions that we ask, um, you know, what's that ideal workflow for creating and improving content? Uh, where are you managing assets? Are you using a dam? Um, or are you doing that on single sites? Hopefully a dam. Uh, um, how, how do you plan to distribute that content? Is this on websites, social media, newsletters? Um, are there specific platforms that are a priority for you? A lot of times we'll start with, um, you know, like email and text message and maybe one social channel that can scale really easily across more and more as time goes on. Um, but it's usually starting with some of the basics, like email's definitely a really big one. Uh, security measures, especially um, if you're working in a higher ed environment or like healthcare environment, those are the things that we're definitely looking at. Um, how you hold your stakeholders accountable. Again, you know, you need to be able to hold people accountable with these governance strategies. It's, it's not like in federated content with my example where people told me no um, and said, I'm not ingesting this content. You know, you, it, you don't have that opportunity in this model. You know, you have to have this highly governed approach. Um, and who can establish those clear lines of governance? So you usually have people that um, can do that decision making. And before you jump on, mm -hmm. um, one kind of key takeaway for trying to establish stronger governance is making sure that when you're establishing your content hub that you're thinking about all of the different stakeholders that need to use that content and trying to accommodate what they need up front. You will get more buy-in if people feel that they have a say in the larger content strategy and making sure you're looking at the system as a whole. Because if you look at kind of one piece and then you're like, I'm going to push this out to everyone and evolve it over time, you may see that you have less people trying to follow the governance strategy. Whereas if you kind of bring them all in up front and say, okay, we're gonna think about this from an organizational standpoint and not just focused on this one key area, that's really helpful. Yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of different product needs and integrations that go into this. So you are using this to coupled framework. So this is just like a sample technology stack um, that can really be used for that seamless user journey. Um, so you'll see you have these integrations. So you might be integrating your CRM or um, your, you know, uh, HR systems and things like that. Um, your digital channels. Uh, so you may be sending uh, content back and forth from Drupal to SendGrid for uh, email campaigning. Um, you have infrastructure and hosting, um, and then your data and analytics and optimization. So uh, we often recommend like a CDP um, as a part of this, so something like Segment, um, but also you know Google Analytics and, and trying to build things out in that uh, direction as well. And um, this is just, again, like a sample architecture for this. So as you can see, there's a lot of moving pieces when you're looking at this decoupled architecture. So you're starting with this like, you know, content infrastructure, you're starting with Drupal here, um, and it's kind of flowing into these web application infrastructures, into those data structures to then be able to be distributed to all of these different places. Um, so again, this is a really complex model and it can get costly. As you can see, there's a lot of different um, technologies here and there's a lot of different pieces that are at play here. But it's also the best way to be able to scale your system over time. And actually, um, we are working with one higher education institution right now that's kind of on the cutting edge of this, um, where we're creating this decoupled architecture uh, for their entire prospective student experience. So um, again, you know, it's not across the entire organization. We're looking at the pieces that, you know, these folks think that, that they can have that high governance with. And right now we have like a marketing team and an admissions team working really closely together to build out this governance so that they can build out this prospective student journey and have, you know, a clear picture of a student from the first time they touch a marketing ad all the way through um, them becoming an applicant. Uh, so that they can collect that data, build a student profile, start to learn more about their students, um, and connect all of these different channels together. Um, so providing that consistent approach 
because so many times, sorry, there's something going on like right out there. <laughs> Sounds like a train. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, you see this so often where, you know, you'll have the financial aid website that's this little tiny website that you can't even find in the process. But now, because that's part of a prospective student journey, you know, we're taking that website in, putting that in the design system, and also being able to syndicate content into financial aid and back to admissions. Um, so this is a really exciting project that, that we've actually just started on, um, but decoupled architecture and trying to really get to that omni-channel experience. And again, there are challenges with this approach. Again, the governance um, is definitely one of the biggest ones that, that we see uh, when building content hubs. Um, just trying to get everyone kind of on the same page and that planning aspect of it. There's a lot of planning that goes into this. So you really have like really detailed discoveries uh, when you're going through this process. Um, and you have to have really careful considerations around the design, around the navigation that's going across all of these um, interaction patterns. So now that you're collecting all of this data, it becomes so much more important to create those personalized experiences and kind of understand how people are interacting. And it can be really time consuming. You have to have the right people on board that, that want to be looking at this um, because it's a very scalable model, but it starts with people um, putting in the effort at that foundation. Um, integrating data from various sources uh, can be a little bit complex. Um, I know I've dealt with a few where sometimes the different data structures um, that, that are used across the organization aren't using the same taxonomies. Um, they're not using a lot of the same structures. Uh, so sometimes that can get complex when you have to kind of go back to the drawing board and get all of those systems to connect so that they connect really well in, um, in a content hub. Um, and also just organizations are really expected in this model to invest in these new technologies. Um, so, which can be really complex, especially in higher ed and nonprofit, it can be really difficult to try to adapt to those changing requirements. So, it doesn't mean don't do it, we're seeing it happen, <laughs> but it just means that you have to have that careful planning, that careful foundation um, put into it and start to look at all of those pieces up front. Um, and some of them you can wait till later, you know, the, um, we've seen a lot of homegrown systems that are being sort of integrated into these content hubs um, very well. Uh, but, you know, over time you may see that that's, you know, the piece that, that you're going to want to change. So it's good to just kind of know that information up front. Anything else you want to add on content hubs? Um, I think for, for content hubs, the the main piece that I would stress from a design standpoint is that you understand your user journey because if you're pushing content out cross-channel, you're going to have users that are coming through different experience lenses and you need to make sure that you understand what that journey looks like and where people may be funneling in so that you can make sure that you continue their journey appropriately as well as make sure that you're having that consistent UX and consistent design experience between the channels that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, uh, so those are the three. Uh, and from here, this is where you really start building your roadmap. So these are just three approaches. Again, there's a lot of approaches. There's things within those three approaches that um, you can you can look at as well. Combinations yeah, of the approaches. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of combinations. Yeah, we see that quite a bit. Um, and you know, creating consistency is a team effort though. So it's just something to really keep in mind when, when you're starting this up. You know, it, there is that collaboration between teams to make sure that this is working. Um, so things like structured content um, that we talked about quite a bit, um, keeping those user experiences, your voice, your tone, um, that consistent, you know, that's really the first thing that you should start to look at before determining the architecture. Um, you know, having that stable site architecture. So, you know, once you kind of figure out what that model is, how do we get that stability in the architecture? And then making data-driven decisions. So where do you want to go with this? If you're going to be really across all of these different multiple channels, you want to be able to track that experience. You want to be able to sh show that ROI and hopefully get a raise. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's our presentation oh. for today. <laughs> <laughs>
have um, a few more sessions today that we're participating in. We would welcome you to join those. Um, one is all about structured content in America's Next Top Content Model, where it's also a game show and it's gonna be fun. So definitely check it out. It's at the end of the day. So it'll be a, a nice end to um, the experience. And then we also are going to be doing um, a panel discussion next week after uh, DrupalCon wraps where we can continue some of these conversations and you guys can ask kind of personalized questions as well. But we won't know who you are unless <laughs> you give Nathan, raise your hand, Mandy, Amanda, Ricardo, Shaney, Emily, Matt, Katie. There are a lot of us. So. <laughs> If anyone has questions, we've got five more minutes. We'll answer questions. So we are required to repeat the question in the microphone so that it's on the recording. <laughs> How do you track analytics in federated models? Mandy, I'm gonna pass that one to you. <laughs> so um, you, can, you can add that tracking parameter to the API itself. So a lot of times we'll just kind of have like a Google Analytics tracking code or a piece of like um, tracking data that kind of goes through the API so that it's syndicated wherever it's going through. So it's yeah, yeah. <laughs> 